All right, we're going to go ahead and get going here. It's our first question. So this question is mostly for Dr. Rigby, but if anybody else has any information, let me know. What about TBIs? Can we get the mic volume up on one? Uh, what about TBIs? Do you have any help in that area at all? Well, there are studies out there and people looking at it, how it can be very beneficial. And the studies I've looked at actually having the, the keto, but if not, even sometimes using some exogenous ketones has shown to help calm down some of that inflammation after that TBI, which could definitely be beneficial. But long-term studies, we haven't seen a lot of those. We we're looking at them, but we don't have them yet. Don't have them yet? Okay. It, do you think it's beneficial to, to go I, on the keto? I don't keto? see anything not beneficial about trying. Okay. Because worst case scenario is you can't tolerate and go from there, but you could get a lot of benefit from changing those eating habits. But I would try to push for the lower that we've only seen in the keto. We haven't really looked at the low carb aspect, but that's why I push a little bit more for the keto aspect. Thank you very much. Hello. Ooh, I might have just turned off the light. Um, I'd like to thank you all for being here for this. This is very informative. Uh, my question is, I'm trying to do intermittent fasting, and I don't know who you can all answer it if you have feelings, but I want to know what can you eat or drink and or drink that will not break your fast? I'm having a hard time with that. Yeah, Dave grinned at me because, uh, so uh, I do work with IDM, and uh, all our clients are uh, fasting somewhat, and that is... We're, we don't have autophagy meters yet, um, especially real-time autophagy meters. I did hear Peter Atia in the podcast saying <laughs> that he would actually use his own money to uh, produce one. So um, there's two levels. First, what are you fasting for? So in other words, um, our clients that are have a more serious condition that they're concerned about, say cancer or a severe autoimmune, then the safest bet is um, salt-only fats. Um, for those doing for fat loss and metabolic regain, then other things can come into play. So you're, you're doing breaking a fast versus so, for instance, a lot of my fasting personally during my fat loss phase was with bone broth on any, especially any two to five day fast. So, bone broth, minimal calories, some protein, yes, did it. Those were very successful for my metabolic healing and fat loss. Um, so, we, we, the answer is we, we just don't know. To, to be on the safe side if you're looking at, and I'm sorry, we, Megan Ramos and I talk about this a lot. Our first response is often it depends, <laughs> two, two questions. So um, the fewer things, the, the more that uh, you're not interfering with autophagy. Um, you know, their mTOR is a calorie sensor and um, Ironically, bone broth has protein, but for for a lot of our clients, they'll do that and then they'll maybe do some salt only or even occasionally water only. Peter, the uh, you you say that land is suitable for ruminants or for. Um, other agricultural pursuits. How do you determine what a piece of land is suitable for? And you know, understand. That? So, if we're talking about looking at a, a piece of land that you would cultivate, then you'd be looking at things like slope, soil depth, chemical constituents of the soil. It might not be appropriate for the plants you're trying to grow. Uh, climactic conditions, so it's not enough precipitation, too short a growing season, those sorts of things. And there are a lot of people that do that kind of classification. 
Dr. Rigby, in looking at the, after somebody has lost the weight, what do you see as the creep coming back to a higher level of weight from what they want it to be? And what are the sort of things that you're doing and are you having success in preventing that? So I always tell people, yes, the, uh, we look at the, the importance of losing weight, but also that weight maintenance. The maintenance is actually probably the tougher part because my, my, I would joke with my patients, my goal is to get everybody to 100. So I take their age and subtract the difference and go, that's how much longer we've got. So what are the things we do? Yes, we might get your weight down in the next four, six months, years. What are we going to do after that? Now, weight maintenance is a key part. And a lot of times in the studies, the exercise becomes a lot higher priority at that time. But again, part of it is being aware and looking at different things. So maybe my goal is to get people off medicine. But if we can get to the point where maybe I need something, I'm struggling, the things I've always been done up to this point is not working. Maybe we now add medicines, but we look at it and have a ratio. But I also give some expectations or understanding that you are going to have a little bit of weight. Could be a time of month, could be stress, could have been a party from this, been traveling, whatever. Let's have some idea of a regulation type thing, but when we start getting higher than that, then we start delving into a little bit more. Maybe something else has changed. Maybe we need to approach it from a different angle or what we did the last time wasn't enough or it helped us get to this point, but now something else becomes apparent. So there's multiple different things to work on that weight maintenance aspect. The weight getting weight down is, in a way, the easy part. It's the long-term effect or the long-term maintenance is the key part. Nobody likes to talk about that part. All right, silly question, but how do I find a family practitioner or a doctor who is okay with keto? Because I have tried several and they all tell me, don't do that, but it's the only thing that's working, so. Uh, uh, Ogden. Yeah. Oh yeah, there are multiple different online ones like Low Carb Doctor that I think we can do more than put it together. At least several others that have been out there. Diet Doctors, that's right, Diet Doctors got one. Um, or if you live up north, I'm available, or at least, at least <laughs> At least can help with some of the doctors, but at least from different aspects. But part of that is also educating your doctor, because a lot of times in med school we get talked to either zero to very little nutrition. And it was actually me trying to figure out why and how. I was actually listening. I'm a big fan of audiobooks and listening to different things. But somebody described it as we've had the whole nutrition aspect, we've got the whole me medical aspect. It's only recently that those two have been coming closer together and starting to work together. So in our defense, well, that's not what we're taught. We're about, oh, we'll just send you the dietitian, the nutritionist. We're going to take care of these other things. Well, it doesn't work that way. So that's where looking at these different things, having that doctor and having that discussion. Don't get me wrong. I'm never saying get rid of your doctor, but if he's not trying to help you or she, is not helping you and you feel like you can find somebody else, look around a little bit. Looks like he's got an answer for you. Can I also add real quick, don't underestimate your ability to change your doctor's mind. Not, not kidding. Like you, you, you talk to a lot of the low carb doctors that are in the scene right now, um, David Unwin, uh, Ted Naiman, right? They all have a story of how a particular patient completely rearranged their world. It wasn't a study that they saw and then all of a sudden acted. It was their own patient that said, no, this is, these are all the health benefits I'm seeing. And all of a sudden they're now having to rethink a lot of different things. So don't be afraid to talk. Don't be afraid to change doctors, but also don't be afraid to let your doctor know say, look, this has really changed my life in a way that's been truly meaningful and has really improved my health. Maybe it's something you might want to consider. One other comment real quick. Just another name in this world is Eric Westman, who owns, has a diet, the weight loss back in at Duke. And it was a patient who goes, he was doing Atkins, and the patient goes, well, I'm here. Let's do my blood work. You have my previous ones. You think it's going to kill me. Let's go do some blood work. Let's go prove that it's really hurting me. And it kind of made Dr. Westman start thinking about it and looking into a lot more. So, again, like he says is, Bring up those things. Again, don't bring all the different research. 
but come in or even buy your doctor a book and say, I got to give you a gift or read this for me or at least something like that. And, and maybe even have the conversation after they're really impressed by your latest labs, right? I mean, so chances are this has been a situation of some kind and now for the first time, maybe, and it may not be true in every case, but a lot of these cases that have been mentioned are where people saw dramatic improvement before they were aware of the diet approach. And then that led to the conversation. And, you know, a little psychology might help. Um, IDM does have a physician's network, so you can Google IDM physician network. And this won't be an option for everyone, but I know more and more uh, low-carb, metabolically aware doctors are doing telemedicine, and some people will not prefer that, but that's, um, in our day and age, that's also an option. For uh, Larry and Ron, when you're starting out with new clients, do you find that they tend to respond better starting out with baby steps or by jumping in with both feet? <laughs> Um, I, I mentioned that's uh, so interesting. I, my preferred method, so I'm fascinated by the word prescribe. Just like breakfast has a lot of ancestral wisdom into it, breaking a fast, the word prescribe literally means um, before, you're writing before. So you're, you're going by what they're telling you, and what you've seen on average. And we have all, and then, it, and there's so many nuances. Some people have been doing um, keto and low carb for years and just not getting it right. So that's a different circumstance than somebody going from a standard modern diet. But me and my wife both transitioned down. I, uh, we did our health regain in the crazy low carb. Um, <laughs> Paleo primal era of uh, 2013, circa 2014. And uh, actually the word keto wasn't as well known. It was more becoming fat adapted. And uh, we ourselves, so that's kind of my bias. And, and I also tell people, one of my slides said, fake it until you make it. Things can get worse before they get better because you can be in a metabolic hinterland. So what that means is you're going from a standard modern diet. You've literally decimated your metabolic machinery to burn body fat or even plate fat. And so your, your brain energy can even go down at first because the brain doesn't know how to use ketones and you're taking away its only fuel source at that time. So it's kind of a metabolic hinterland. So that's where you can warn people about that. It's, it's a little bit more than the keto flu. Fake it until you make it. And that, that support, I also, I only lost two pounds my first month. And a lot of my clients have found that I ended up losing 100 pounds in a year. But that's really helped a lot of clients. Because the body will triage. You might fix things. For women, they often start slow. And then their, their fat loss ramps up. And in IDM, we ask people to keep track of how clothes are fitting, like what Dr. Rigby said about the scale line. So ideally, you can be gaining muscle mass. And so I want people to track how well their clothes are fitting. One of you mentioned um, exercising while fasting. I can't remember who. Um, how long into a fast? Do you do your exercise and then do you eat right after or do you fast a few more hours? How does that work? You know, I wasn't that person, but I just want to throw this in real quick. Ancestrally speaking, in the last 2.5 million years, we've had lots and lots of fasted periods where we were doing lots and lots of stuff. And let me tell you, lots and lots of stretches where there was hunting at very high rigorous activity and that was just the norm, right? It's only recently, this is the new thing that we've been doing in the last few decades where we've said, hey, why not have food 
available around the clock and eat whenever you'd like to. That's what's new. So from as best as I can tell from my experiments and all the different times I fast and so forth, it actually seems like it's best for me, and it seems that way for many people I know, to exercise, especially while fasted. That actually there's a lot going for you, such as the lack of engagement in your GI tract, right? So there's plenty, I think, of evidence to suggest that exercising while fasting is not only great, but we had people like, uh, uh, of course, of the two keto dudes, Richard um, Morris, will actually fast for like a full week and then do a massive bike ride before finally deciding to break his fast. So I just wanted to add that. Very briefly, um, fasted exercise, the studies out now, I have that one slide. That's, um, there's like 12 studies now. It's one of the prime triggers of autophagy. And there was a really cool study. The average age was 69. And just exercise in general, again, Dr. Ridley brought that up. So many degenerative diseases were helped. Um, exercise is a great trigger of autophagy. And if you follow Ben Greenfield, Mike Mutzel, you also increase HGH and testosterone. And then you have a pretty wide number of hours that you can do a refeed. You don't have to do a refeed right away at all. And, and it's great for putting on lean muscle. Um, walking in the morning, it doesn't have to be a strenuous workout. Walking in the morning is excellent fat loss tool and will get you deeper into autophagy. So, you, you know, yoga, tai chi, um, but then, of course, more strenuous exercise is also good. Hey, Dave, uh, I was just wondering in the data set that you recently got access to, is there any information there about oxidized LDL or LDL particle count? Not that I'm aware of, by golly, if there were. <laughs> I certainly would have reached for it. To be sure, um, I, I want to emphasize that I actually, the, the data that I received wasn't everything that they have. It was basically what I had asked for because apparently there's a little more curation process that they have to do on Tommy and his team side. Uh, but I'm pretty confident oxidized LDL wasn't in there because the original, the, the NHANES uh, study, they have like these big trucks that go around, they have these labs. Uh, oxidized LDL is kind of uh, even still sort of considered a little esoteric uh, and is not, it, usually you need a specialty lab to get it. Do, the, do you think that uh, the energy model that you, that you talk about explains why you might have high LDL particle counts with small dense particles when everything else looks good or high oxidized LDL when everything else looks good? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, actually, uh, to give you a fuller answer to that, I'm not at all surprised when I see, uh, for example, a fairly serious athlete who has a high LDL particle count, and they have what would be considered a high small LDL particle count because let's say, to give you some round numbers, let's say they have 2,200 LDLP, and then they have 700 small LDL, which is, you know, the cut line is like 500, but they have 700. That's not surprising to me because that's about 30% against the 2,200. And that proportionality I see very common among uh, athletes, especially ones that deplete their, I'm sorry, I'm going to get really geeky here for a second. If you're trafficking more VLDLs and the cargo in the VLDLs are the triglycerides, right? And you are utilizing more of the triglycerides on a per particle basis you're taking more of that cargo off of those ships, you are actually making them smaller. The difference, the different, key difference, it's very important, is the composition of what I'm describing is very different than what we see in somebody who's metabolically deranged and has a high proportion of small dense LDL particles. In that person, it tends to be something closer to like say 70% of their LDL particles are small dense. And the composition is more triglycerides and less cholesterol. And the one I just talked about with the athlete is much more cholesterol and less triglycerides because they depleted more triglycerides on a per particle basis. I have an example. He doesn't want me to talk about his data, so I'm going to try not to identify him. But there's a uh, ultra marathoner that I work with. And we've done some exciting tests. I hope at some point he'll 
allow for his identity to come out because he's kind of a name. Uh, but he actually uh, has some of the highest small dense LDO particles after a very serious run. And his triglycerides are like at the on the floor. It's so small, right? But his his CRP is also rock bottom. His inflammatory markers look great a few days after the exercise, after the intensive exercise. Sure, right in the wake of it, it's a little bit worse, right? But then again, he's running like freaking 100 miles. The point is, I definitely think that there's a lot more to the story. And as per my talk, it's so much more about context. And the energy model is, I think, a very large portion of the context when you are metabolically healthy. Now, if you're metabolically deranged, a lot of stuff is out the window and it becomes a lot more complicated. But while you're metabolically healthy, I wouldn't be surprised. Sorry, I suppose that was a bit long, but it's an important, it's an important question. Uh, it's probably for Larry, um, but anyone who wants to talk about fasting can answer for me. I, in your talk, you talked about most of the IDM folks who do 42 hours or less for fasting, but then I've heard you and Megan and Brenda and several other IDM folks say, I do three, five, seven days. At what point in the journey do you start talking to folks about doing these longer fasts? Um, that's driven, again, by the client and where they're at and how well they're responding. Uh, I normally ramp people up. And it would be um, people that we have indications that do have fat in their organs still and can benefit. So where that 42-hour came is that in the IDM clinic, and I'm not part of the IDM clinic, but they found people with fatty organs and um, type 2 that three 42-hour fasts or three 36-hour fasts, so most of the time in the Fed state, most, most days eating, but those were very effective protocols. Um, again, for depending on the client and what they're looking for, uh, we're, we have a diversity of people. Brenda does more extended fasting. In fact, we're starting kind of group sessions in our program. Brenda's handling the extended fasting. I'm doing more of the IF stuff. I just had a client this week um, because I'm rather new. So he just had his first 72-hour fast, and he uh, emailed me the other day and said it went awesome. So um, I'm building people up to that. He does have... Um, a sizable amount of body fat to lose still. So um, it's a little bit the lean mass hyper responder stuff. <laughs> Just one thing to add to that, to be careful, especially doc some doctors get a little worried with that. It's more of the refeeding aspect at the very end where something can happen. So if you bring it up with your doctor, you're doing this. A lot of times we worry about more of the electrolyte balance when you start refeeding and stuff like that. So just be a little cautious with that aspect. All right, we've got two more questions here. We're going to wrap up and go to lunch. Uh, Dave, I actually was curious what your, if you even looked, the LDL um, results from people taking statins and their uh, all-cause mortality, and if that was did extend their lives or if it, it decreased or maintained. I, I have to be careful about what I say next. <laughs> um, I definitely did. And I will say it, it was definitely very surprising. Perhaps the way that I did it made it look a lot worse than it actually is. But I will say that it looks bad enough by the way that I did it that I didn't want to include it in my presentation because if I didn't dot my I's or cross my T's well enough, it would potentially be a lot more explosive. So that's why I'm trying to be careful to just say, yeah, it doesn't look good for statins in that data set. Given what I had done up to that point, but I really want to confirm it before I make that public. Thank you. <laughs> I, 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 I legitimately want to connect with a researcher where I want to say, look, this is what I did, how I did it. You tell me if there's anything wrong, if I didn't carry the four right or whatever it is. But um, I'll say this. There's, there's something that's kind of anomalous in that data set in that the 
uh, statin users had overall shorter average follow-up time, which was a bit odd to me, like why, why there would be less overall follow-up time. That, too, popped out when I was first trying to compare mortality and I wasn't taking into account follow-up time because I was like, oh, it looks like actually statins look really great against all-cause mortality when you didn't know about follow-up time. When you just for the follow-up time, it looks quite different. Uh, but, but, again, I want to be intellectually honest here. I think it's fair to speculate that some margin of people who are on statins relative to people who are not on statins are going to be more engaged in the healthcare system may, in fact, already be closer to a state of sickness, right? The, the catch is that, again, with this NHANES data, we have the benefit of longer follow-up periods of time. So that argument doesn't carry as much weight if, for example, the average follow-up time is in the years, especially if it's like five years, eight years, something along those lines. So this is, this is why this is kind of a game changer in many respects. Go ahead. Um, so this question is for Dr. Rigby. Um, when, you're, when you were going through the medications on your slide, how do you size up the profile of patients that would be suitable for uh, met metformin versus Topamax versus hormone control? You know, I, I know those are broad categories. Do, are you looking at stall outs? You're trying to do the least invasive thing with stall out. So, just what's your thought process to put the, the, the patient in the appropriate uh, treatment scenario? Part of it is looking at what the risk factors are. Then, also, a lot of times we're not adding a lot of medicines until after we get the blood work back. Um, so, we're looking at some of that insulin, the A1C, or other markers, elevated CRP, um, looking at some of those problems. And then asking what the biggest struggle is, what's the big thing they struggle with? If it's more of cravings, or is it cravings, or is it just always hungry? If it's always hungry, I might add something appetite suppressant. If it's more lab results, I might just add metformin. If it's a um, kind of a, an addictive type thing, I might add some, not on the list, is naltrexone, which we'll use to help block some of those craving effects. So again, combination of what they're having, plus what the labs show, plus what the history has, plus on top of it, what have they tried in the past? If it works in the past, it might be worthwhile trying again, or, and then adding some other things with diet and stuff, because unfortunately most doctors go, oh, here's your fentanyl, you should lose some weight, we'll see you in three months. Well, what about changing eating habits? What about following up on this? What about this? We don't, a lot of them don't look at it, they go, well, fentanyl means an appetite suppressant, you're not eating as much, you're gonna lose weight. Well, not always. It could help, but it might not. So trying to look at those different aspects and then kind of helping that individual aspect versus, well, I know there's a lot of programs out there where you walk in, you walk out with these four medicines. Well, why be on if you don't need it? You have a question? All right, last one, guys. This one's for Dave. Um, so the other day, I saw a Facebook post. I think it was on Dr. Barry's group. Anyway, um, somebody was posting something about a protocol that you do to drop your cholesterol. So I, I was just wondering if that was like something you do to appease your doctor so they don't freak out when your cholesterol comes like, <laughs> over the top. It was sort of like four-hour eating windows and broccoli. I don't remember the first thing, but four-hour eating windows and broccoli, and then, that, and then uh, 12 hours later, had your labs drawn. Oh. Is that something? Oh. Okay. Yeah, let's make a distinction. So first of all, there's there's what's kind of commonly known as the Feldman Protocol, which is just uh, eating loads and loads and loads of fat over like three days, and then being sure that you have like a 12-hour window. So basically just being keto, having lots of fat. We have a write-up at cholesterolcode.com. It's just clearly labeled Feldman Protocol. I, last year, wanted to demonstrate the, the metabolic connection to LDL and intentionally went on a diet that I knew nobody would recommend for health. That was the whole point. I wanted to go on a high carb, low fat diet, and I actually intentionally wanted to have meat too, because oftentimes we hear about meat as the reason for high cholesterol, et cetera. So no, it was uh, white bread and processed lean meat, right? That was the only two things that I ate the whole time. And I ate loads of it, and as I predicted, as I predicted, my uh, LDL cholesterol dropped at a record level. 
Uh, I think, it, so it started out at, I want to say, 296. My LDL was at 296. And then in seven days, it had dropped to 83. So I dropped it by 213 milligrams per deciliter. Right. Yes. Eating what I would consider to be practically trash. Right. So I wanted to emphasize not to eat that. That's, a, that's one of those experiments that I don't want to be associated with the protocol. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No. No, my, my thoughts, look, so much of my research is so much about elucidating this core component that I feel the medical community is clearly missing the boat on. And it's very relevant to us as low carbers, right? So, yeah, it's the boats. And so cholesterol is taking a ride on a larger energy metabolism, and it matters whether or not it's fat-based. Like that's, that's the elevator pitch to it. Now, if you're wanting to lower your cholesterol to appease your doctor, right, okay, then, then you don't need to say much more than that, right? <laughs> but I will say this out of uh, some, because this gets brought up on occasion, Occasionally, it is sort of funny. There are a number of people who are patients who, when they find out that they have high cholesterol, have already become aware of my my work before they got those numbers. Their doctor complains to them, and then they go, "Oh, can we retest in like a week or two? And that, yeah, and the doc and the doctor goes, "It won't matter. Your cholesterol is not. No, it's just 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 you know, a week or two, right? And then they do the protocol and they come back, and that's actually converted some doctors. There's actually been a number of doctors who all of a sudden became aware of low carb because of the Feldman protocol. Uh, but, but all of that fun stuff said, I'm not an advocate of deceiving your doctor, no matter if they're pro low carb or not, right? So, no. <laughs> Yes, I, I'm generally, I speak from some experience, experience doing these experiments. A lot of them I half jokingly say I do so you don't have to. I also half seriously say I do so you don't have to. Please don't do that. As, as Siobhan Huggins will vouch, it was probably one of the worst moments that I've had. I was a horrible boss and I was terrible to collaborate with and it was just, it was a terrible experience. And by the way, I had enormous hyperinsulinemia throughout the whole period. I could tell because I had a continuous glucose monitor, which was just creepy and scary to watch. My two cents are, if you're going to try to lower your LDL and you want to do it for an experiment, consider the Feldman protocol. Don't consider a fast metabolic shift over to refined carbohydrates. Just my two cents. All right. We're going to take a break. We're going to be back at 110. Round of applause for our panel. <laughs>